Thank you all for coming tonight, um, especially on such a wonderfully spring-like day. I'm glad that you're all here for our presentation. Um, before I introduce the speaker, um, this is being recorded. Um, so if you are going to ask any questions at the end, um, please wait for me to bring you the mic um, so you can ask them into the microphone. Um, and we'll be reminding you during Q&A too. Um, but tonight our speaker, Chuck Millis, um, is going to talk to us about historic cemeteries in Northern Virginia. Um, Chuck Millis has a passion for history. He has roamed the world researching historical topics and is delighted to have lived most of his life in Northern Virginia, one of the most historic regions in the country. He now lives on the banks of the Potomac River on land once owned by George Washington. Chuck is a graduate of Penn State University and has advanced degrees from Penn State, George Washington University, and from George Mason University. Chuck is a member of the Board of Directors of the Prince William Historic Preservation Foundation, a member of the Fairfax County Cemetery Preservation Society, a former member of the Board of Directors of the Manassas Museum, and has acted as a docent at the Carlisle House Historic Park in Alexandria. He is the author of over 40 books. Um, many of which he has here tonight. Um, and he is also the producer and co-host of the cable TV show, Virginia Time Travel, a history television show that airs to some two million viewers in Northern Virginia. When not writing or doing historical research, Chuck can be found kayaking on the Potomac River. Um, so it was without further ado that I introduce our speaker, Chuck Millis. Thank you, Jen, and thank all of you for coming out on this beautiful night. You should be out there enjoying it, since I understand it's going to be 94 on Saturday. <clears throat> OK, let's talk about historic cemeteries. Now, obviously, we can't talk about all of them, because there are some 1,000 cemeteries in Northern Virginia, ranging anywhere from small family plots to great national cemeteries covering hundreds of acres. Now, Northern Virginia is a treasure house of history, and one unique way of appreciating that history is by visiting a cemetery. Cemeteries have been called open-air museums, and every gravestone has a story. So let's start at the beginning. Now we all know that the first permanent European colonist reached this area in the late 1600s, carving out farms and building small towns. Now, the town of Dumfries in southern Prince William County, and how many of you know where Dumfries is? Anybody? Oh, I'm, wow, I'm impressed. Okay, the small town of Dumfries in southern Prince William County became an important port for the export of tobacco, and it rivaled New York and Philadelphia and Boston and it reached its zenith in the 1760s before it fell afoul of environmental change. And it got silted in, and the port got left high and dry. But not before it left some rather unique gravestones. Now, when we think of colonial gravestones, we think of the elaborate gravestones maybe from New England, or even some in Virginia, and they're carved and they have poetic verses. But here you have the gravestone of some of the common folk, things you don't usually see that nobody's really interested in. They carve their names deep into these field stones. And here you can see the date, 1772. Now, Dumfries reached its absolute historic zenith, and nothing has happened there since. When, when George Washington marched his army through there on his way to Yorktown. Um, now, moving up the river towards Arlington, we come to this place. And it's called Ripon Lodge. And Ripon Lodge is one of the oldest colonial country houses still standing in Northern Virginia. Now, it's a modest farmhouse compared to the great palatial homes of the great patrician Virginia planters, which allows us a rare glimpse at the life of the middling folk of the 18th century. Richard Blackburn, who built Ripon Lodge, was a master builder, and he built this house along with many of the early churches in this area. 
and it was to master builder Richard Blackburn. The George Washington's father turned in 1735 to build a house on a bluff overlooking the Potomac River, the house that was later to be known as Mount Vernon. Now the survival of this early structure within the fabric of the present Mount Vernon is confirmed by a diarist who in 1801 identified the central portion of the house as having been constructed by the general's father. Now, Richard Blackburn's tombstone is in the family burying ground at Ripon Lodge. And the tombstone tells us that here lieth the body of Colonel Richard Blackburn, who died July the 15th, 1757, preferred by the governor to the most eminent stations and command in the colony. The tombstone says that Blackburn was a man of consummate prudence, frugality, and industry, whereby he made a large fortune in a few years. Now, I love this tombstone because it tells us volumes about what the people of the time valued, prudence, frugality, and industry, and above all, your ability to make a large fortune in a very short period of time. It's all there in the tombstones, folks. <clears throat> OK, now, Ripon Lodge is unique not only because of the Blackburns, but because it has become the repository for other early tombstones. One of the oldest tombstones in Northern Virginia dates from 1690 and belongs to one Rose Peters. The inscription reads, she is gone, oh she is gone to everlasting rest, to Christ our beloved savior who loves sinners best. Now we don't, <laughs> Now, we don't know much about Rose Peters, but we do know she was a sinner because, because she was expelled from Middlesex, England in 1685 for behavior unacceptable to her neighbors. <clears throat> now, another girly grave is that of Martin Scarlet. Now, Martin Scarlet was a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses from 1680 to 1695. In the late 1600s, Scarlet acquired Burbage's Neck, which included the land where Ripon Lodge is now situated. Now, after the Scarlet family died out, a farmer bought the land, and he decided that he was going to take the tombstones from the family cemetery and use them as the foundation for his barn. Now, Scarlet's own tombstone is quite large, and he couldn't use it for the foundation, so he threw it into the Occoquan River, where it was later found and placed between two trees at a wildlife refuge on Belmont Bay. Now, it was later moved to Ripon Lodge in the year 2005. Now, this picture was taken in the 1930s, in the mid-1930s, and it shows Martin Scarlet's gravestone in pretty good shape after almost 250 years of natural weathering and a stint in the Occoquan River. But when you look at that picture and compare it to this one, which I took recently, this recent photo of the same gravestone shows the impact of 80 years of pollution on the gravestone as the area has become more urban. More acid rain causing pollutants are released over urban areas, and you can see the impact on gravestones. <clears throat> now, continuing up the Potomac, we were reach Woodbridge, and since you all know where Dumfries is, you must know where Woodbridge is. Uh, and we come to the Grayson family vault. The Grayson family vault in Woodbridge is on a hill overlooking Marunsco Creek. The family burial vault was originally located on 1,000-acre plantation. Now less than five acres remain undeveloped. 
The burial vault now sits in the midst of a Woodbridge residential neighborhood, and you can see the houses in the background there. It was encased in concrete in the early 1900s by the Daughters of the American Revolution and has recently been repaired. Now, William Grayson is important because he served during the Revolutionary War as an aide-de-camp to General George Washington. He was a member of the Continental Congress, and he was one of Virginia's first senators. Grayson died on March the 12th, 1790, the first member of the United States Congress to die in office. Now, there's another notable member of the Grayson family buried here, and that's the Reverend Spence Grayson, a so-called fighting parson of the Revolution and a lifelong friend of George Washington. Now, speaking of the American Revolution, perhaps the most venerated tomb in America is that of George Washington. Washington died on December the 14th, 1799. Congress resolved to build a marble monument in the new capital. Martha Washington granted her consent. A crypt was provided under the dome of the Capitol, but the project was never completed because in his last will and testament, George Washington expressed a desire to be buried at Mount Vernon. Now, George Washington had a great fear of premature burial, and he requested of his doctors to be decently buried and not to let my body be put into the vault in less than three days after I am dead. Now, this wasn't a morbid fear. Premature burial was quite common until the 19th century. In Victorian times, some graves came equipped with bells, and a string ran from the bell into the coffin so that if you woke up, having been prematurely buried, you could ring the bell. So George Washington wasn't being weird here. <laughs> okay, George Washington was entombed in the existing family vault, seen here, which is now known as the old vault. And that was on December the 18th, 1799. Well, visitors weren't very impressed. <clears throat> and one visitor wrote that the tomb was a low, obscure, ice house looking brick vault, which testifies how well a nation's gratitude repays the soldier's toils, the statesman's labors, the patriot's virtues, and the father's cares. But fear not, George Washington was a man with foresight. And in his last will, George Washington directed the building of a new family burial vault in the following words. The family vault at Mount Vernon, requiring repairs and being improperly situated besides, I desire that a new one of brick and upon a larger scale may be built at the foot of what is commonly called the vineyard enclosure. In 1831, Washington's body was transferred to the new tomb. A French visitor wrote that Mount Vernon had become like Jerusalem and Mecca, the resort of the travelers of all nations who come within its vicinity. Now, veterans of the American Revolution connected deeply to Washington through pilgrimages to the tomb. Many pilgrims were overwhelmed with the emotion and wept. An early diarist recounted the following. One man placed himself on the green turf and mused, with his head resting on his arms. Another stood among the thicket with folded arms and downcast eyes, and a third reclined against a tree and wept. There was nothing artificial in this, nothing premeditated. Now, the family mausoleum evolved over time. 
the marble obelisks, which you see here <clears throat> in front of the tomb, were erected to the memory of Bushrod Washington and his nephew, John Augustine Washington, who in turn were the masters of Mount Vernon. Both are buried in the inner vault together with many other members of the family, including Martha Washington. Bushrod Washington was the favorite nephew of President George Washington. In 1802, upon the death of his aunt, Martha Washington, he inherited Mount Vernon. Now, Bushrod Washington spent 31 years as an associate justice of the Supreme Court and died in 1829. When he died, he left the Mount Vernon to his nephew, John Augustine Washington, who survived Bushrod by just three years. In 1850, his widow Jane conveyed Mount Vernon to their son, John Augustine Washington Jr., who was the last private owner of the estate before it came under the custody of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. You might be interested to know that John Augustine Washington Jr. Uh, was a Confederate officer, a lieutenant colonel, who served as an aide-de-camp to um, Robert E. Lee and was killed at the Battle of Cheats River. He's buried up near Charlestown, West Virginia. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> near George Washington's tomb are the unmarked graves of some 150 slaves, including William Billy Lee, Washington's personal servant during the Revolutionary War. <clears throat> William Lee was freed in Washington's will for his faithful service during the Revolution and received a substantial pension and an option of remaining at Mount Vernon. Lee lived on at Mount Vernon until his death in 1828. Now another slave buried here is one West Ford, who some claim is George Washington's illegitimate son. According to Linda Allen Bryant, a direct descendant of West Ford, there is an oral tradition in the Ford family indicating that West Ford was the child of George Washington and a slave named Venus. Now, the Mount, La Mount Vernon Ladies Association says that Yes, West Ford was probably sired by a Washington, but not George Washington. Um, Venus was actually a slave who belonged to his brother, and his brother had two rather lusty sons, one of them being Bushrod. Uh, so the paternity may reside with them. At any rate, at the present development stage of DNA science, no direct link to George Washington can be established but the Mount Vernon Ladies Association have pledged their cooperation with testing as DNA science progresses. And I'm sure you all know of the events surrounding Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings at Monticello, so it's this kind of thing that emerges uh, over the years, and what might once have been dismissed now has to be taken somewhat more seriously. <clears throat> now here we have descendants of Washington slaves gathered at the memorial dedicated to their ancestors. Now when George Washington died, there were some 317 slaves living in Mount Vernon. Under the terms of Washington's will, his slaves, not including 40 who were rented, or the 154 slaves belonging to Martha Washington were to be freed upon the death of his wife. Now, the terms of the will created an almost immediate problem for Martha Washington. The only thing standing between 123 slaves and their freedom was her life. Thanks a lot, George. Now, according to a contemporary letter written by Abigail Adams, Martha Washington did not feel as though her life was safe in their hands. Nor was this 
fear groundless. The records of colonial Virginia document the trial of 180 slaves tried for poisoning. Martha Washington freed all of Georgia's slaves within a year after his death. She never freed her own slaves. Okay, let's now turn to the dramatic events surrounding the Civil War era. Virginia seceded on May the 23rd, 1861. Long before dawn on the morning of May the 24th, eight Union regiments crossed the Potomac River to seize Alexandria. Union troops entered Alexandria unopposed. Colonel Elmer Ellsworth led his men down the empty streets until he came to the Marshall House Hotel, which was flying a huge Confederate flag. Now this flag was so big that it is said that President Lincoln, using a spyglass, could see the flag from the White House. Ellsworth, followed by his soldiers, went inside, hurried to the roof, and with a knife borrowed from a common soldier, cut down the emblem of rebellion. Ellsworth started back down for the street with the flag tucked under his arm. In a shadowy hallway, he met the proprietor of the inn one James Jackson, and Jackson produced a shotgun and killed Ellsworth. Within seconds, he was cut down by one of Ellsworth's soldiers. Now, according to friends, ardent secessionist James W. Jackson had obstinate determination stamped on every feature. A coroner's jury at Alexandria found that Jackson came to his death at the hands of the troops of the United States while in the defense of his private property in his own house. Ellsworth, a, president, a personal friend of President Lincoln, lay in state at the White House before being sent to New York for burial. Now James Jackson was initially buried in the Jackson family cemetery in Fairfax County. And he was later reburied next to his wife Susan and other family members in the Fairfax City Cemetery. And that's his grave there. <clears throat> now, Alexandria became an important supply and hospital center for the Union Army. And many soldiers died in the city, requiring that burial space be found. First known as the Soldier Cemetery, Alexandria National Cemetery is one of the original 14 national cemeteries established in 1862. The first bur burials were soldiers who died during training or from disease in the numerous overcrowded hospitals around Alexandria. And if any of you have been watching Mercy Street, you will have seen some of those hospitals, <clears throat> which is really not a very good show in my opinion, but. But, but we digress. <clears throat> By 1864, the cemetery was nearly filled to capacity. <clears throat> now, thousands of freed slaves also looked for safety around Alexandria. Often they found horrible living conditions, sickness, disease, and death. In 1865, the military governor of Alexandria seized the pasture of a Confederate sympathizer and established a burying ground for the freedmen. Some 1,700 freed people were buried here. Now, over time, the wooden markers memorializing the dead at the Freedmen Cemetery decomposed. In the 1930s, the George Washington Memorial Parkway was built over part of the graveyard. Construction of the Beltway destroyed the southern edge of the cemetery. And in a final indignity, in 1955, a gas station was built atop the graves. But there's good news. The cemetery was rediscovered by archaeologists and historical researchers in 
in the activity surrounding the expansion of the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. And it was purchased by the city of Alexandria in 2007. On May the 12th, 2007, the site was rededicated as the Freedmen's Memorial Park, which you see here. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> because of the continuing need for cemetery space, Arlington National Cemetery was created as a military cemetery to accommodate Union dead. Private William Henry Crispin from Pennsylvania was the first soldier to be officially buried at Arlington. A laborer, Crispin enlisted in the United States Army on March the 25th, 1864. He was hospitalized for measles five weeks later and died on May the 11th without ever having fired a shot. He was buried on May the 13th, 1864. By the end of the Civil War, there were some 16,000 burials at Arlington. Now the first memorial to be constructed was the Civil War Unknowns Monument, which was meant as a tribute to Union soldiers. The bodies of some 2,000 dead soldiers were collected within a 35-mile radius. Now, most of these were partial remains or unidentified remains. Uh, because of the inability to identify remains, it is thought that some Confederates were also entombed in the Civil War Unknowns Monument. Now this was redesigned over the years. This is the second design of the memorial and it, the lid, the top, was redesigned to look like the Ark of the Covenant. Now, several hundred Confederate dead were also buried at Arlington by the end of the war in 1865. Some were prisoners of war who died in custody. Some were executed spies, and some were battlefield dead, as we've mentioned. But the federal government did not permit the decoration of Confederate graves. After all, these were traitors. In 1868, families of dead Confederates were barred from the cemetery on Decoration Day, what we now know as Memorial Day. Union veterans prowled the cemetery, ensuring the Confederate graves were not honored in any way. Families of Confederates buried at Arlington were refused permission to lay flowers on their loved ones' graves. Another group originally buried at Arlington were more than 3,800 former slaves called contrabands during the Civil War and they're buried in section 27. Their headstones are designated with the word citizen or civilian. Now Arlington National Cemetery was segregated until 1948. Veterans of the United States Colored Troops, USCT, were also buried in section 27. The 175 regiments of the USCT made up some 10% of the Union Army. And after the Civil War, soldiers in the USCT fought in the Indian Wars in the American West. Now, we come to the Spanish-American War, and the government is interested in recruiting soldiers from the South. So, the federal government's policy towards Confederate graves at Arlington National Cemetery changes. On December the 14th, 1898, President McKinley announced that the federal government would begin tending Confederate graves, since these dead represented a tribute to American valor. On June the 14th, or June the 4th, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson dedicated the Confederate Memorial at Arlington, which you see here. The Confederate Memorial was dedicated to reconciliation and the hope of a united future. 
Now, shortly after the Civil War, <clears throat> the U.S. government launched a widespread effort to locate and rebury Union soldiers. Now we move west from Arlington out into the boondocks of Fairfax County and further into Prince William County. By 1870, over 90% of the Union casualties, almost half of whose identities were unknown because soldiers in the Civil War didn't wear dog tags. They had no method of identifying bodies. Some soldiers would carry letters on their person in the hopes that a friend would find their body and send a letter back to their families, but there was no official method of identifying the dead or notifying families. But by 1870, 90% of the Union casualties had been accounted for in national cemeteries, private plots, and post cemeteries. But no such government effort was made for Confederate dead, so honoring the Confederate dead fell to private groups. This is the Confederate cemetery at Groveton out at the Manassas battlefield, and it houses 266 dead Confederates. Now, most of the dead at Groveton are unknown. Only two graves have marked headstones, Private William G. Ridley of the 6th Virginia Infantry and Private James J. Palmer of the Palmetto Sharpshooters. Both were killed in 1862 during the Second Battle of Manassas. Now, this was a private cemetery. It was acquired by the National Park Service in 1973. In 1866, the trustees of the Ladies Memorial Association canvassed Fairfax County, and eventually some 200 unknown Confederate soldiers were reburied in a common grave atop a hill in the Fairfax City Cemetery. In 1888, the Confederate Monument Association was formed and erected a suitable monument, which you see here, to both unknown Confederate dead buried in the cemetery and the Confederate soldiers who died far from Fairfax County on unknown battlefields. Control of this private cemetery passed to the city of Fairfax in 1962. Now, Civil War burials are still being found in Northern Virginia. <clears throat> An undiscovered Confederate cemetery has been reported in the heavily wooded Union Mills area near Clifton. In 1997, a relic hunter stumbled on a burial near 5900 Centerville Road and contacted county archaeologists. Six soldiers were buried there. Now I would like to uh, mention some rather unique sites. And one is the grave of Long Tom at Pohick Church in Lorton. And according to his gravestone, Long Tom was an Indian chief. And that's about all we know about Long Tom. According to legend, an Indian chief named Long Tom was shot and killed by Susanna Alexander, either in self-defense or to save the life of her husband, John. Now, according to press accounts from the 1950s, Long Tom was an Orinoco chief, but I have not been able to find any Orinoco tribe in Virginia. So, nor have I been able to find any other historic mention of Long Tom. But we know Long Tom existed because we got his gravestone. So it's a mystery. Now, another unusual story is also associated with Pohick Church in Lorton, <clears throat> and it relates to a place called the Ramium. Now, the Ramium was a huge family mausoleum erected on land belonging to Pohick Church by controversial Bahia faith leader Charles Mason Remy. <clears throat> 
The Ramiyam was constructed over a 20-year period, 1937 to 1958, until a disagreement between the Poet Church and Remy resulted in legal action. Now, the mausoleum was designed by Charles Remy as a memorial to his family's contributions to America. According to the Washington Evening Star and Daily News of April the 9th, 1973, the mausoleum was planned as a magnificent complex of walled courtyards, underground chambers with soaring vaulted ceilings, marble reliefs and statues, carved pillars, chapels and burial vaults. vaults. Now Remy devoted most of his considerable fortune to building this burial complex, and it was done on a pharaonic scale. Some two million bricks were used in its construction, and Remy planned to build a huge three-story structure, a Bahia temple, above the underground mausoleum, which would have dwarfed colonial Pohic church. Now, when this was built, the Ramiam and Pohic Church were located in what was then rural Virginia. And the sprawling complex became a point of destination for vandals, teenage vandals and motorcycle gangs. And there were booze parties and drug parties and sex parties. And in the underground culture, it became known as the Crips. And it finally became a public safety hazard. And the elders of Poet Church were afraid that these people running riot out there would end up by burning down the colonial church. And this is when they got into the legal battle with Remy. Remy was off living in Europe, doing all kinds of things. He finally gave up. The Remium was abandoned. The graves were moved, and the structures were bulldozed over in 1983. And this is all that remains of the glories of the Ramiam. OK, on a more positive note, perhaps the most romantic tombstone in Virginia is that of Alexandria's female stranger. In September 1816, a young couple arrived in Alexandria. Now, the lady was very ill. She remained in her room at a local inn, Gatsby's Tavern, which you can still visit, until her death. So what secret did the young couple hide? Were they eloping? Was she an English aristocrat, royalty, the daughter of a prominent politician? The identity of a female stranger remains a mystery which has lingered beyond the grave. Her ghost is also said to haunt Gatsby's Tavern, if you, that is of interest. Now, biography often plays an important role in gravestone inscriptions. The tombstone of Mary Packard at the Ivy Hill Cemetery in Alexandria tells us that she was a missionary in Brazil. We know little else about her life, but this bit of biographical information tells us what she thought was the most important aspect of her life. The tombstone of Lancelot Minor Blackford at Ivy Hill Cemetery captures a wealth of biographical information, including his service in the Confederate Army, and his long tenure as the principal of Episcopal High School in Alexandria. It also captures the essence of the man, servant of the Lord, gentle, patient, an apt teacher. Prize fighter Joe Lewis wanted to be remembered as the world champion. His gravestone at Arlington National Cemetery portrays Lewis in a fighting stance and is inscribed the Brown Bomber, World Heavyweight Champion, 1937 to 1949. Joe Lewis died in 1981. Gravestones are sometimes inscribed with bits of philosophy. Harold Snowden in 
1836 to 1901, served as a surgeon in the Confederate Army. Later, he was a surgeon in private life and editor of the Alexandria Gazette. He's buried in the Wilk Street Cemetery complex, and his epitaph reads, he stood four square to every wind that blew. May they say the same of all of us. <clears throat> Contemporary tombstones are often inscribed with very personal lines of philosophy. This gravestone in Fairfax City reminds us life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. A nearby tombstone reminds us don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. The preservation of historic cemeteries is an ongoing challenge, and I urge you to support it whenever and wherever you can, because it's certainly not going to do itself. British Prime Minister William Gladstone once said, show me a manner in which a nation or community cares for its dead, and I will measure with mathematical exactness the tender sympathies of its people, their respect for the laws of the land, and their loyalty to high ideals. For the most part, Northern Virginia has done an exceptional job in honoring the dead and preserving the nation's historical legacy. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I think Jen's got microphones if anybody has any <laughs> questions. I'm Charlie Clark. It was an excellent talk. Uh, I was going to make a follow up comment and see if you can fill in some detail about the Marshall Tavern and the death of uh, Ellsworth and Jackson because, you know, there's today and it's, it's at Market Square in Alexandria, as you probably know, and it's the Hotel Monaco, and there's a plaque there erected by the Sons of the Confederacy, and it pays tribute to the first martyr of the Civil War, Jackson, and there's no mention of Ellsworth. So a year ago, after the tragedy in Charleston, when all this new talk about removing some of the Confederate legacy uh, in Alexandria, there was talk of removing that plaque, or at least erecting a more balanced description of the events. And it seems to have fizzled because I was just there a week ago and the plaque is still there. So do you know anything about that? Uh, I think I read something about it. Uh, it's an ongoing you know, controversy and it's quite heated, as you know. I mean, from what I've read about Jackson, I mean, he was a real sweetheart. I mean, you know, before, before this, he, um, there were, this area, was very balanced, in I won't say very balanced, but it was not unanimously secessionist. There were a lot of Quakers, there were a lot of Northerners, it was a, it was a diverse area, even at the uh, outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, There's a little town um, called Akotnik, it was settled by the Quakers, and Jackson, about a week before he was killed, was down there trying to hang some Quakers who had voted against secession. So he was a real sweetheart. <laughs> he really was. I don't want to say he got what he deserved, but. <laughs> uh, in your book, do you uh, talk about or have pictures and or have pictures of any cemet uh, cemeteries in Arlington other than Arlington National Cemetery? That's the only one I have. As I said, this is a huge area. I mean, I'm doing a follow-up book um, called Civil War Graves of uh, Northern Virginia, which will be coming out in the fall. Uh, plug, plug, plug. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, you could write many, many books. Uh, no, I, there's, the only one I cover is Arlington. <clears throat> I'm curious about the family cemeteries that are scattered all over Northern Virginia. And if you could tell us, how are they accounted for today in subdivisions and things like that? I mean, I... I know somebody owns the land there, and I'm assuming they're fenced off. But are they at risk of being bulldozed over? Oh, it's it's a it's a quite a controversy as you get out into uh, Prince William and Western Fairfax County. 
I'm on the preservation board down in Prince William County. There was a family cemetery behind, behind a firehouse. There were huge meetings on that. There was another family cemetery. They were trying to expand the athletic fields at one of the high schools. That got, you know, they looked for um, whether there are any living descendants. Uh, that they need to be informed. In that case, at the high school, they disinterred the bodies and moved it elsewhere on the property so that they could, um, you know, expand the athletic fields. But a lot of times, these cemeteries, especially the smaller ones, you know, people will knock over the gravestones and hope that nobody knows that there's a cemetery there so that they can, you know, do development and whatnot because they don't want to be bothered with all of the laws surrounding cemeteries. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever get down to uh, Potomac Mills, which is a huge shopping complex. There's a cemetery right in the middle of one of the parking lots. I mean, what a heck of a way to spend eternity. <laughs> um, I happen to go past the Pohig Church on a regular basis. Can you be more specific about where the Ramium is in relation to the church? Um, yes, it's, if you go, the church sits here up near the road, and if you go to the back of the church property and up a hill, the top of that hill, you'll find that um, tower that I had in my slide, and then there's a big mound of dirt. Um, about the only time you can get there is in the winter because other times it's covered over with brambles and other unpleasant stuff. But that's where it was. Well, thank you very much. You. I think that was uh, interesting and informative and <clears throat> Mr. Mills is now approaching the table, which has a number of books. I'm sure he'll be happy to visit with you as you come to his table.